most of us don't realize that we get consumed by fear instead of using fear. So fear becomes our being in the sense that Fear becomes what controls us. It tells us what we should do and what we shouldn't do. It tells us how we should think and we shouldn't think. It stops us from doing stuff that's really important to us. And it makes us do things that we would never ever do. It makes us say things to people that we love that we would never want to say to them. And on the other end, it stops you from saying things you really want to say to someone because you don't want to appear weak and your ego won't let you. So fear takes this really magnetic controlling effect on our whole lives. But fear at the same time can be one of the healthiest things because it's basically giving you a signal as to what's important. It's basically giving you as a signal as to how you feel. And when you use it as a signal, not as a suggestion or a push, it changes everything. So let's let's make that practical. When you are in your home and if the fire alarm goes off, that gives you a signal to say, check for the fire, check if there's a fire, right? Now, if you go, oh, just turn it off, it doesn't matter. So let's avoid my fear, let's avoid it. Let's just turn it off, let's forget about it. Your house could burn down, or if you're lucky, there was nothing and it's fine. But the odds are that there could be a fire. Now, if you're someone who goes, well, let me inspect it. Let me be curious about that. I am scared that there's a fire in my house now that I've heard the fire alarm, but let me be curious, let me inspect, let me check. Imagine we approached our fear in that way. Imagine every time I felt scared, of something, I said, well, let me get curious about this. Why am I scared of this? Why is it affecting me so much? What about this scares me? Is it all of it or is it just a part of it? When you start doing it, you start to break that fear down and that's the healthy way of looking at fear rather than the unhealthy way of saying, forget about it, keep it away from me. I don't want to go there. And so for me, I really feel that fear is what blocks us from these beautiful breakthroughs in life. And it has such a chokehold on us, like it has such a strong hold on us. And I think most of us are living our lives because we're scared of what someone will say, what someone will think, or what someone will do. And that feels like something that we're gonna regret when we're at the end of our lives. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because running the business is hard and waking up every day and getting to work when you're all by yourself is hard. And the thing that saved me, that continues to inspire me, motivate me, give me hope, inspiration, ideas, is looking at the stories of people who've done a lot more than me. And I learn strategies, I get motivation, and it gets me to believe in myself to go off and attack the day. And so I hope this video inspires you to do the same as well. So today, this one from one of the best, Jay Shetty, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two is learn to communicate. I have a check-in for every day, every month, every quarter, and every year with your partner. There's one question per item. So one check-in every day, one check-in every month, one check-in every quarter, and one check-in every year. Every day, check in with your partner and ask them, what did you do for yourself today? Mm. What Beautiful. did you do for yourself today? Beautiful. Just check in with them because I promise you, they've been trying to do everything for you, the kids, mm. their family, but they didn't do anything for themselves. Check in, what, what did you do for yourself mm. every day? Every month, check in with them and ask them, what can I help you with? What can I be a part of? What can I support you with? Because over that month, they so may be good. going through so many so different good. things, now you get a chance. Every quarter, this is one that I do with Radhi every quarter. It's uncomfortable, but it's needed. I ask her this question. I actually ask her three questions. Is this relationship going in the direction you want? Mm. If it is, what's going right? What should we do more of? If it isn't, what are we both willing to do about it? So beautiful. What's that collective responsibility? And then once a year, what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve this year? So those four check-ins, yeah, so simple. every day, every month, every quarter, every year, yeah. you will always be in touch with the heartbeat of your partner and the pulse of where they're at. Rule number three is let go of your past. We're always trying to create the same past yes. as opposed to a new, future. a new future. And I find that what's really interesting about that, all the studies show that nostalgia makes us believe 
that the past was more phenomenal than it actually was. Yes. If you remember that party you went to at college, it's better in your memory than it actually was. If you actually could have gone back and remembered how you felt hungover and right. what you broke a bone or whatever happened, but now in your memory, it's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Right? So our memory also is slightly warped of the past. No question. It can make things feel much better or much worse sometimes. No question. But what's what's really coming out for me right now is this idea that it's, it's something you said a couple of moments ago and, and it sparked a thought for me. I remember the story that Vanessa Bryant told about Kobe Bryant mm. after he passed away. Mm. I was fortunate enough to interview him around three months before, it, before his tragic passing. And she told this story and she said that mm. Kobe would play through every injury. He would play through every pain. He would mm. play through everything, even when the doctors and his coaches would say, stop playing. Mm. And she asked him, she said once, why he still plays, right? Again, going back to our yeah. curiosity, yes. not assuming you know your partner, she asked him, why do you still play? And this is just her and him. There's no cameras, there's no, she's telling this story, but at the time it was just them two. He said it's because there's someone who's paid for a ticket today. They saved up. And this is the only time they're ever going to be able to come. Maybe a son's, maybe a dad's brought his kid. Maybe someone's come to the game. They're a lifelong fan and they came today. And today's the only day they're going to get to see me. And if I say I'm injured, yes. they won't get to see me. So, awesome. so I'm going to play yes. so that that person, that one person gets to see me play. And yeah. then he goes and wins. Yes. And it's like, that's love. Rule number four is practice gratitude. I like to set myself up by saying, what are the habits that I can practice today that are going to make me feel like my day is going in the right direction? And they are truly simple. Thankfulness takes 30 seconds. Here's the best way to practice it. I don't recommend a gratitude journal. I don't make it, recommend writing it down. I recommend expressing it, making it specific, and personalizing it. If you do that, gratitude actually has the ability to boost your immune system. It has the ability to shift your perspective and boost your mood. But if you do it in a way of, I'm grateful for the air, I'm grateful for my kids, I'm grateful for my job, that doesn't have that impact and effect. Because it stays with you. Because it stays within you and gratitude is meant to be shared. It's a gift that you get to give someone else. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free there's a link in the description below go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business i'll see you there rule number five is stay connected one of the things i found was if you ask most couples today what is their most common activity to do together the majority of people i think the studies show like 70 to 80 percent and i think it's probably more if we really talk to people the number one thing they do with their partner is watch TV. Mm. That is the most common sure. activity. Yes. So now you're, two people are watching TV, and yeah, we're not that surprised by it. Two people are watching TV, and most likely you both have an iPad or an iPhone in your hand too. So now not only are you in this world, they're in their world, you're also supposedly <laughs> spending time together right. in this reality, when the truth is you're definitely not spending time together but more importantly, you're exchanging zero energy. Yes. So what you're I literally going to those devices and that moment to turn off. Yeah. To de-stress. Correct. But if but that's the only way, that, that's you're saying you're that, turning off the yeah, relationship. Yeah, you're turning exactly. And so, do your sound effect again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> right. You're swiping this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so like you're doing all of that really, really fast. I can't do the sound effect, but you're doing all of that really, really fast, but this relationship is not moving anywhere. And so what I created yeah. in the book and in my coaching practice is four levels of intimacy and they're four E's and they're ex escalating levels of intimacy. So entertainment with your partner is the lowest form of intimacy and connection i.e. watching TV, Ooh, watching a show. That, that is not, even me and you, when have me and you ever watched a TV show together? Never. 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 And we would say that 
sure, we may not know each other deeply, but we have deep conversations that wow. are intimate, vulnerable, right. open. We've never watched a TV show together. Right. I've never watched a TV show with Lewis Howes. Yeah. Uh, I've never, even we hang out all the time because we both live in LA. I've never watched a TV show with anyone in that room yeah. that, that I'm friends with. I don't think I have either. Yeah. Or a movie for that yeah. matter. We've never done that. Every night we'd waste so much time trying to figure out what to watch, find nothing to watch or find Been something there. that really didn't work. And then you're dissatisfied with your relationship right. because you go to sleep feeling so unfulfilled. So again, I, again, I love movies. I, 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 I even sometimes love video games, but the point is, that can't be your point of connecting with your partner. Right. Don't say that that is your intimacy building. That's great. Right? The next level of the, the next state of uh, intimacy escalating one step above is experiences and experiments. And the way I define this experiences, everyone knows date nights, restaurants, trying to go out together, trying to make an effort together. And I find even that can get really like exhausting for people and boring and, it, and you still end up on your phones. That's why I add the word experiments. An experiment is where both of you are a beginner. Doing an activity together where yes. both of you are not pros. Maybe you go pottery. Maybe you go kayaking. Maybe you go to a paint class or try painting at home with a YouTube channel. Yeah. Maybe you're gonna try construct something you've never done before. Yes. Take an activity where neither of you are professionals or experts, so there's no ego, and I promise you, you'll learn something new about your partner. A you might learn learning they, journey. They have I like a little this. hidden skill. They have a little hidden gem in them. So try and experiment. A step above from that, you'll love this one, is education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take a course together, mm -hmm. read a book together. And, and even me and Radhi struggle with this. Read your own books and then discuss about it. That's what me and Radhi do. So uh, three nights a week, Radhi will be reading a book she loves or listen to a podcast she loves. I'll be reading a book I love. And then we'll gather together to excitedly share what we learned because we don't like reading the same stuff. So, you know, and then the highest level, which really just escalates so much intimacy and vulnerability in a relationship is engagement. Go and serve together. Mm. Help out a soup kitchen, mm. a homeless shelter. Mm. Go to the trenches, go, go and serve together because the connection you're gonna have when you've had a shared experience of you've just given a bowl of soup to a child in India together and you've witnessed the joy on their face and the experience that they're having, you're, the intimacy you feel with your partner, this is nothing compares to it. Yeah. So. I want people to escalate up that journey and realize there's more things we can do than eat at restaurants and watch TV. Rule number six is eliminate the three C's. What would you say to somebody though who's in a relationship, just a tough question, start out early in the company. <laughs> go for but it. I'm in a relationship, I just heard you say that and I go, not only is that not our pattern, because sometimes relationships take patterns. Yeah. Not only is that not the pattern, but I feel like this person's almost competing against me. Mm. And sometimes, even, the, even though I feel like there's some sort of love there, they really aren't supporting, yeah. um, helping. Not only are they not helping with my goals, they're not supporting the goals that I have. Does that mean you're not in a loving relationship or are there some strategies you can have to better connect where we get on the same page on that? I think first place I start is that there are, when I was a monk, I learned about these, what the monks called the three cancers of the mind. Hmm. and they are comparing, complaining, and criticizing. Hmm. And what I find in relationships is that we're constantly operating in one of these dynamics. You're either complaining about your partner, you're comparing your partner to other people, or you're criticizing your partner. Wow. And when you're living in these three ways, wow. there's no room for growth, and the problem is, your partner can't be doing anything that I talk about in this book because they never went to that class. Mm -hmm. They never got to go to that school and neither did you. So what you just said so beautifully, we just assume people know how to love. Let me just take that idea. Do you just assume someone knows how to drive a car? Right. Do you just assume someone knows how to be a doctor? Right. Do you just assume that someone knows how to fly a plane? Like, right. you would never assume that, right. but we assume that love must, ah, oh, love's easy. Right. Love's easier than driving a car, right. and love's easier than flying a plane. No, it isn't. It's, it's so much harder. Rule number seven is confront your discomfort. There's a thought I've been having recently, and it's that comfort creates self-care, mm. but discomfort create self-respect. Oh boy, I love right? that. Like, I right? Like, it's what you're that. saying. I love that. That the one more discomfort mm -hmm. every day, yes. that's where self-respect comes from. Yes. You don't- Great term. You, yeah, you don't, you don't start to trust yourself or build self-esteem or believe in yourself because you just say it to yourself. Amen. It's coming, what you just said, you go out there and take one more meeting and see what you learn. Yes. You go out there and take one more risk, yes. one more 
discomfort. The people that I know that are the most successful and happy mm-hmm. have more uncomfortable conversations. Agreed. They have more uncomfortable days. Mm-hmm. They have more discomfort in their lives. Yes, totally but, agree with that. But selected discomfort. But one of the other things that I'm asking from now, I'm like going into like the people that I know that, sure. that I'm, I'm thinking about, I can see their faces yep. and, and I want them to know that I'm asking for them. A lot of the time, one more in the wrong direction That's right. can also be really misguiding. Mm-hmm. Sometimes uh, people, and I know you're a person of faith too, and so, so we can touch on this, Sometimes we're climbing the mountain and we keep doing one more, mm-hmm. but we're actually going further away from who we are, who we want to be, yeah. our faith, our partners, right? Yeah. We've, we know people who've built multi-billion dollar companies, yeah. but lost their kids. That's right. Or they've become famous and rich, but they've, uh, their partner cheated on them. Yeah. Or, you know, like we really know a lot of those. stuff. And yeah. you know, people who didn't do all of that, yeah. that's happened too. Sure. Like it's, it's both ways. How does one use one more and make sure it's in the right direction? Rule number eight is learn from challenges. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, right? So if you find in your life, when you reflect about this question, that you're going through the same challenges regularly, remember a challenge will never go away until you learn what you're meant to learn from it. So if you're seeing the same challenge coming up again and again in your personal lives, realize that it's trying to teach you something. As soon as you extrapolate that lesson, you get on to the next challenge, right? They don't go away, but you go up a level, you go up to the next level. So notice that as well. Remember, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Well, number nine is study love. I write about things that I feel I want to obsess about for years, or things that I've obsessed about for years. And when it came to love, I just saw in my personal dealings, my own experiences, when I sat down with couples that had been together for 50 years in coaching or couples that had been together for five days, I saw two things. I saw people who had discovered their passion, they were winning at their financial goals, but their home life was falling apart. Mm. Their partner cheated on them. Their partner was abusive towards the kids. Maybe it wasn't that extreme. Maybe it was just that they were just irritated and right. angry all the time with their right. partner. And at home, their happiness was dictated by what was happening at home. Yes. And then I saw the other side where I saw people who were struggling at work. Maybe they had a boss that talked down to them. Maybe they had family that didn't believe in them, but their partnership was beautiful. Yeah. It was a source of strength and a source of joy. And so I looked at that and I thought, you know what? Love is that central pillar in our life. It's that lifelong pursuit that we all know will give us the greatest joy, but it's something that was never taught to us at school. We were just expected to know how to love. Yes. When we, we work harder to get a degree, we work harder to get a driving license <laughs> than we do to get married, which is insane yes. and settle down with someone. And so I wanted to dedicate the last few years of my life to studying love, to researching love and coaching about love. And that's where the eight rules came from. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is pursue your truest goals. The challenge today is, I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. Now, just let that blow your mind for a moment. I will explain it, I promise. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am, which means, we live in a perception of a perception of ourselves. So I'll break it down. If I think, Rangan thinks I'm smart, I'll say I feel smart. But if I think, Rangan thinks I'm not smart, then I'll say I'm not smart. And so the challenge is that we're basing how we feel about ourselves on what we think someone thinks of us. And and the greatest challenge with that is, how do you have any idea if what you think someone thinks about you is even true and whether that's even the best place to start. So that's where our identity struggles. We start pursuing things in life because we think other people value them. It's almost like, let's think of the most playground version of this. If I remember wearing high-tech shoes from BHS to the playground, right? I remember my mom, because my parents didn't buy me Nike. Uh, trainers uh, or Adidas trainers, which I always wanted. You know, we didn't come from that background. I, d- I couldn't, couldn't afford them and my parents didn't want to, me to have them. So I'd walk in with my high-tech 
trainers from BHS to about 10 quid or whatever they were. <laughs> and, 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 you know, to me, it didn't make a difference. I didn't really know at that time whether high tech was good or bad. They were just trainers that my parents bought me. Now, everyone, the cool kid at school, had the latest Nike trainers. All of a sudden, I start thinking that he's now surrounded by everyone. Everyone's talking about his trainers. Everyone's giving him adoration. Everyone's giving him respect. Everyone's talking about his trainers. So now I think that if I want to have that same experience and love from people, that I need to get that. Not realizing that I may be able to get deeper love from people by being kind and compassionate. That I may actually be able to build a real relationship with people if I'm loving and, and considerate and empathetic. And it's so crazy how your life can become about pursuing something. And that's why Jim Carrey puts it best, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, you know, everyone in the world should achieve everything they've ever wanted and accomplish everything they've ever pursued just to realize that it's not the point. Now, that doesn't mean the monk mindset is not about not pursuing your goals. It's actually about pursuing your truest goals, your truest self and your most authentic aligned goals. So it's not about not having goals. It's about making sure that your goals are actually yours. I had one of my teachers that has kept saying to me for years, he goes, if you want to move three steps forward, you have to go three steps deep. And so if I'm not going forward, I know it's because I haven't gone deep. So for me, that's a big priority for me. And that's what I try and do when I'm, I try and do that every day, but I also believe in immersive experiences. So a lot of us today, we live in this world, which is like 10 minutes a day. Do it for 10 minutes a day, everything will be great. And that is great, there's nothing wrong with that. But imagine you spent, with a boy or a girl, your partner, whoever it was, someone that you just started dating. Imagine you spent 10 minutes a day with them. How long would it take you to figure out whether you wanted to fall in love with them or not? Probably a long time. And so when you go immersive, you spend a weekend away with someone, you know whether you like them or not. And meditation, mindfulness, all these habits are the same. The more you immerse yourself, the more you get an experience that stays with you, the more that you can live with that experience and keep going back to it for 10 minutes a day. The trifecta around all my videos is I listen to someone who shares a challenge with me. So if you ever share a challenge with me, you have to be okay with the fact you may end up as a story in one of my videos. Right? I'm just throwing it out there. The, the second thing I try and find is I try and find a scientific study to verify what I'm about to say as a solution. And the third thing that I do is I try and find a piece of wisdom that's thousands of years old that also aligns with that. So for me, that's what I'm always looking for and that's how I create my content because that way I can verify it through modern science. It's, it's timeless wisdom that's been true for thousands of years and at the same time, it's based on a real challenge that we're all going through. How many of you feel like the months are just passing by and it's crazy to believe that we're over a quarter of the way through the year? But this is what happens when we don't have really clear goals, targets, and tasks. This approach has really helped me manage my time better. I have big monthly goals, I have four weekly targets, and I have one daily task. The one daily task is the baby step towards the weekly target, and the weekly target added up, all four of them, leads to the big monthly goal. So what you're doing here in essence is breaking down something that feels quite unachievable, impossible to do, and quite challenging into small manageable chunks. Sometimes you can be sitting there thinking, wow, I don't know how I'm gonna get that done by the end of this month. If you've ever felt that way, use this model. First, come up with how can you break that big goal down into four separate tasks? Once you have these four weekly targets, now all you need to do is divide each weekly target into a daily task. So basically, you end up working on something daily that you achieve weekly, which helps you achieve something monthly. Now you've completely deconstructed this impossible, unachievable idea into something very simple and manageable. Where do you begin when it comes to building this new skill around how you think about love. Mm -hmm. Where would you tell somebody? Is it rule number one? <laughs> it is rule number one in the book, but I think you've just brought out a beautiful point that I want to respond to. And it's that we all have a story that we're writing about love. And the interesting thing is that our mind makes us fiction writers and we're writing our own fictional version of what our love story looks like. And it changes every single day. One day we feel like anyone would be lucky to have us, but then there's months that go by when we feel we're completely unlovable and we're not enough. 
And I think it's really interesting because we both know this, that the story you're saying to yourself, the story you're telling yourself naturally becomes your reality because you're looking for the facts. You're looking for those truths in your life. So if you think to yourself, you know, no one's attracted to me right now, you're now going around looking for how many people are not attracted to you and don't look at you. It's almost like when you make a decision to say, I'm thinking about buying this brand of car or I'm thinking about buying this brand of whatever it may be. Now you see that brand everywhere, you hear it everywhere. Right, right. It's not that suddenly everyone just started buying that car on the streets or buying that product or brand, but you see it everywhere because it's at the forefront of your consciousness. And so if the story is, I'm not good enough, I'm not ready, and I'm unlovable, which is a very true and real story of the people that are writing in for us, that unfortunately is what you're going to perpetuate. And that's why rule one is about what you do alone. Because if you're waiting for someone to love you, to believe you're lovable, that means you're saying that the day they change their mind, you're now immediately unlovable. Mm. And so you're deciding whether you're lovable or not based on whether someone else thinks you're worthy of love. And I think that that sets us up for a lot of pain, a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. How many of you have ever found yourself in a random rabbit hole on social media? <laughs> right, you, you start off watching a friend, then you end up on a cat video, a dog video, and then somehow you're watching a video on Justin Bieber's mom, and it just kind of goes on and on and on. There's this incredible study that I love quoting at the moment, when men and women were asked to be alone with their thoughts for 15 minutes, or choose an electric shock. 60%. 60% of men chose an electric shock and 30% of women chose an electric shock. So we don't want to be alone with our thoughts for 15 minutes. So social media has just provided us a way to fill that 15 minutes. But it's us who are so uncomfortable being alone. How many of you pull out your phones and then put it back inside your pocket and then wonder why you pulled it out in the first place? <laughs> Anyone else do that? I do that all the time. And then you, you convince yourself that you looked at the time, but then when you ask yourself what the time was, you don't know what it is. You know, we take our phones out of pocket 200 times a day and check, check all our posts 2,000 times a day plus on average. For me, it comes down to a place of personal discipline. Capitalism means you're going to be hit by multiple messages forever. Before social media, it was the billboards. Before the billboards, it was something else. I wasn't alive. But the point, the point is that there's always been a way in which consumerism and capitalism will constantly try and bombard you. So we can either sit here and complain about it or be upset about it. But guess what? Social media is not going away. There's a beautiful thought from Martin Luther King that I always think of when, when I answer or I'm thinking of a question like this. And he says that those who love peace need to learn to organize themselves as well as those who love war. Those who are coming from a place of love, compassion, and empathy rely so much on just love, compassion, and empathy. We don't get strategic, we don't get focused, we don't hustle hard, we don't work. And that was the difference commitment that I decided to make my own life. I was like, if I'm gonna be an ambassador for change, if I'm gonna make wisdom go viral, if my videos are gonna be the most seen videos on social media, which they are, I'm gonna have to work as hard as someone who wants to break the world. What do you do in those spiritual retreats? Usually I like going to the eco village in Palgar, Vada. And I like just switching off. I literally won't be on my phone. I'll completely unplug. And I like to just go back to living in a meditative monk-like way in the way that I used to. And to be able to just wake up at 4 a.m. every day, meditate again for many hours, reflect, journal, introspect. I find that getting to do that for two to three weeks a year is such a great reset. I find that naturally because of our careers, we're always on our phones and we're always plugged in and that's great and that's fantastic. But I think once a year, it's so powerful to just completely switch off. So I won't reply to any emails. I won't check my text messages. We will have pre-prepared our content in advance so that people are still served and the community is taken care of. But I don't have to worry about any of that.
I believe there is definitely a pressure to pursue your purpose. And I think sometimes the pressure to find your purpose actually paralyzes you in the process and in the pursuit. And so I think when we are guiding people or talking about purpose, we have to have very thoughtful and mindful conversations around it. Now, if someone comes up to me and says, Jay, I don't know what my purpose is. Can you help me? As you just put there, I would focus on the definition of purpose that comes from the Sanskrit term Dharma. In my first book, Think Like a Monk, I talk about this concept of Dharma, which has many different definitions. But one of my favorite definitions that it has is eternal purpose or eternal duty. It means something that you're naturally inclined to do, something you have proclivities and propensities for. And I think both you and I love the Japanese Ikigai, the reason for being, why we live. And Dharma and Ikigai have a lot in common. And so I always tell people, look, purpose is this big, scary, word that needs to be simplified. And so my first simplification is, let's see if we can discover four things. The first is what you're passionate about, what you're really interested in. And if you're like, Jay, I don't know what I'm passionate about. I don't know what I'm interested in. We go to the root and we say, well, what are you curious about? What is it that you think intrigues you, even if you're not passionate about it yet, if that's a strong word. The second thing I'd say is, what are you naturally good at? What do you already have expertise or skills in that you aren't even aware of or you're not even conscious of? So many of us have so many talents, so many hidden gifts, but we keep placing them on the back burner. The third thing I'd ask is, is there a pain in the world that you want to solve? Is there a problem in the world that you feel really calls to you. Some people don't find their purpose through their passion. They find it through their pain. They find it through a stress they want to alleviate in the world, a challenge they want to remove from the world. And then the fourth and final one is, as Ikigai says, is, uh, can I get paid for it? And that's a, that's, a, that's a fourth and final consideration because I don't think purpose has to be something you have to get paid for. It can be something we dedicate our weekends, our evenings, our vacations to as well. And so the way I define it is that your passion makes you happy. And when you use your passion in the service of others, that's a purpose because it makes them happy. So how can you use your gifts and your talents and the things you love to improve the lives of others. That's what purpose really is. And now we're not looking at it as this big word. We're actually looking at it as this broken up equation of what am I passionate about? What am I excelling at? What problem do I want to solve? And then if I can, how can I get paid for it? I think we live in a world right now where we have such a responsibility for how other people grow up, think and believe and breathe. Like the young generations that are all growing up right now, like the amount of impact that one word you say, one product you sell, everything you do can either wire that person's trajectory into just consumerism and materialism, or you could be doing exactly the same thing and you could change someone's trajectory to passion, purpose, and living a meaningful and fulfilling life. Shareability is the currency of social media. If your content is less shareable, it gets less views, it gets less engagement. The most viewed content is the most shared content. The most shared content is the content that made you feel one of these things, not made you think one of these things. Still till this day, the number one feedback I can get is me opening up an email or a DM where someone's randomly messaged me and it says, you just stopped me from committing suicide. Like that, like nothing compares to that. Like genuinely no big deal size, paycheck, campaign, whatever. None of that compares to that feedback. Like if I read a message that says that, that message always gets a response. I remember during the pandemic and even after, I was getting calls from so many people that I work with or so many people that my work is involved in. It could be companies, it could be people, it could be individuals. And they were all just saying, oh, Jay, your work's so important now. And I was just like, I've always believed mental health is important. I've always believed that there is no quality of life without good mental health and well-being. And I don't think that that's actually ever changed or will ever change. I think that's a truth that will last the test of time because as a human, you get a mind, you get a body, and you have to take care of it. And so 
I feel really happy that people are coming to that realization and reflecting. I feel sad that it's coming because of pain and suffering. And I feel, you know, it, it, it saddens me that we have to go through so much tragedy and pain to come to a point of realizing actually I have to take care of this. But I know even in my own life, that's what I had to do. Like mm -hmm. the only time I took my body seriously was when my body gave up on me. And the only reason why I worked really hard on my mind at times was because it was challenging. And so I think we do find self-care in times of discomfort. Rule number two was take a look in the karma mirror. And you started it right off because the word karma, we have this association with it, but there's a misconception about what it really means. Mm, yeah, I think that we have a very limited understanding of a lot of Eastern concepts and Eastern words. And I was very fortunate having lived as a monk for three years. I spent a lot of time studying the Vedas and spiritual literatures that give insight and depth to these concepts and words that we now hear, like we hear kismet or karma, or all these words are thrown around in the Western world, but we don't necessarily have the most thorough understanding of the word. And so karma is often, you know, what goes around comes around. Yeah. I think there's that great Justin Timberlake song, right? Like it's yeah. like, and it's like, whatever you do, you get it back. There's some truth in that, but that's not fully what it is. So karma is this cycle of impressions forming into ideas, forming into patterns in our life. So let me break down what I mean by that. When you make a choice in your life, that choice has a certain reaction or a certain consequence. And that consequence is there to teach you about whether you choose to do that again. So let's use that for health. When I see a fried burger with a bunch of fries with a sugary drink right there in the evening, and I get attracted to that and I'm like, that's what I wanna eat tonight, I make that choice in the moment, it feels amazing, but then the next morning, I don't feel as good. That consequence is not I got what I give out, that consequence was for me to reflect on, do you wanna eat that again? Next time when you have that choice, is that's what you're gonna choose. And so I feel like that's what karma's trying to do. So sometimes you make a choice, and we don't look at how we make choices, we focus far more on the result. So let's think about this. How many times have you ever dated someone later on to realize that they were the wrong person. But you never went back to think about how you made the decision to be with them. You were just really upset that they were the wrong person and they hurt you or whatever they did. But what if you went back and said, oh, actually I chose to be with them because they were controlling and that made me feel safe. Oh, wait a minute, I chose to be with them because they kind of took care of everything and fixed all my problems. So I thought that they knew what they were doing. Oh, wait a minute, I chose to be with them because I was in a weak place and therefore they made me feel a sense of safety and certainty and I let them do that. Oh, now next time I make a decision to be with someone, let me make sure that I'm not basing it on that criteria. Let me actually go in as an equal. So that's what karma is trying to get you to have that reflection. We live in a perception of a perception of ourselves. If I think you think I'm smart, I feel smart. And if I think you think I'm stupid, I feel stupid. And so we're basing our self-worth on a perception of a perception. Do you know how messed up that is? <laughs> it's like, not only is it someone else's subjective opinion that you don't even know, so you're being subjective about someone's subjectivity. And that's what we all experience on a daily basis. We've forgotten our reality. If there's one habit that I have every single day, it's refining my intention. Because your intention is the easiest thing to lose. You know, how would your friends describe you in three words? My question is, how would you describe yourself in three words? You know, it's, it's always been about how other people view us. And when life is lived through how other people view us, we make decisions based on how we think other people will view us when we start something new, when we try something new. Our ego convinces us that what we believe in and what we're fighting for is the right answer. Not realizing that everyone could be wanting the same thing, just they're coming from a different angle and a different priority set. And so we can have the most impact when we recognize the uniqueness of everyone's priority set, and we can have the most impact when we focus on our own and invest in our own. How does your morning routine, which I think we spoke about the first time you came on my show, how does that help you tap into your purpose or I guess continually 
refine your purpose? Because I think there's something really powerful in what you do each morning that many of us can learn from. So my morning routine is made up of four key habits. And these four habits I have in the form of an acronym called TIME, T-I-M-E. And so T-I-M-E, the T stands for thankfulness. I start my day with thankfulness and gratitude. And the way I do that, Rangan, is I have a little post-it note next to my bed that says, what are you grateful for? And so the first thing I see in the morning is this post-it note that says, what are you grateful for? It's a question back at me. Uh, I remember when I used to have... uh, not a bedside table, I'd have it on my ceiling, I'd have it on my bedside wall. And what I love about that is you can write down any question you want. Uh, This comes from the idea that we have 60 to 80,000 thoughts per day. And studies show that 80% of them are negative and repetitive. Now, that's quite scary to look at. And the truth is you can't control 60 to 80,000 thoughts per day, but you can control the first thought of the day, and the last thought of the day. And so for me, when I wake up to that post-it note, I am training myself to make the first thought of the day a grateful one, a thankful one. The I in my acronym stands for intention or insight. And I try and set my intention for the day. Uh, Usually my intention is I want to be of service. I want to be able to give love. I want to express love. I want to be an ambassador of purpose and compassion in my life, in my day. And then there could be a more specific intention. Like today, it's like, well, I hope I get to share energy with Rangan. I know Rangan's been going through a lot of personal things today. I hope that my energy, he's choosing to spend time with me. I hope that that can serve him, serve his community. And so I'm setting a really powerful intention. Uh, The M, T-I-M, M is for meditation. I meditate every morning. I do three types of meditation, which is what I was trained in as a monk. It's meditations I teach. It's breath work for the body, visualization for the mind, and mantra for the heart or soul. And so I do my three techniques. What I find is really what I'm trying to do is in the morning is align my body and mind. Because what I find is, Rangan, we usually wake up in the morning and our body is ahead of our mind. How many times, anyone who's listening or watching, have you ever felt where well, your body's running around, but your mind is just still in bed? Or you experience the opposite. You wake up and your mind is racing, trying to do everything, yeah. but your body is feeling exhausted. And so for me, breath work brings my body and mind together. Visualization allows me to visualize the day. What am I going to do? How am I going to show up? Who are the people that I'm going to meet? What kind of energy are we going to exchange? And then the mantra or sound meditation is the repetition of sacred sounds, affirmations that again become my internal dialogue. And then E is exercise, movement. At the moment, I've been hiking. Uh, I've been doing a 45 minute to an hour hike every day to get some really good cardio in, to get my heart rate uh, moving. And so that's my morning routine, pretty much five days a week. It's probably a couple of days a week that I'm a bit more flexible. I remember after I had my first viral video, I didn't want to make any videos. Really? Why? Because, because you're scared of success. Like you're scared of- But weren't you excited? You're like, oh, 50 million views. Like all these people. You, you get, well, that's the point, right? Like it, at one point, it has to become about more than the success or failure. And that's where the meaningful mission, it comes back to that, right? Yeah. It, it always comes back to that. And I was talking about this with our friend and we talked about you too. It's so funny. I was talking to Stephen Bartlett recently because uh-huh. I was in London and we talked about you too because we're talking about relationships. And he was saying what he'd learned from you and the conversations you guys have had. And, and now I'm talking about him to you. But <laughs> he, I, was, I was talking to him about the idea of just like getting comfortable with the idea that at one point we all have to embrace insignificance and irrelevance in a public sense, but that in an internal sense, the meaningful mission was what was carrying you. Yes. So if you stop because people stop following, or if you start only when people are following, then there isn't a meaningful mission. Because the meaningful mission is what you were doing, whether people were following or not, because it's what you wanted to do and who you wanted to be. And so I think it comes back to that, that if you only play when you're winning and you stop when you're losing, 
or you don't pivot and learn yeah. a new way to serve, then there isn't a meaningful mission at, right. at the bedrock of it. And exactly. so I love that the meaningful mission is at the heart of everything because there will always be changes. Like your the platforms will change, yeah. the algorithms will change. People the, will come and go. People yeah. will come and go. And you see the people that have lasted the test of time it's usually people who have a meaningful mission, as yes. you were saying, who want to keep serving, keep giving. They feel they have that. We have a lot of fun together. We've had a lot of fun over the last 10 years, for sure, without a doubt. Like whether it was when we've traveled together, when we've started Joyo together, when we've uh, moved, whether we, you know, we're in this tiny shoebox apartment yeah. or whatever it was, like we've had a great time. But the greatest great time is when you're learning and growing together yeah. because you actually learn how to improve your relationship. And that's what makes your relationship better. Yeah. So when I talk about your partner as your guru, what I love is that if you look at Eastern traditions, gurus are not the people who tell you what to do or preach to you or act smarter than you. The guru, like the monk gurus, they would come and sit at the back of the class and listen to a young monk yeah. give a talk. Like that's what gurus did. Or when you bow down to an elder guru, the guru would bow down to you on the floor, even yeah. if they were twice your age. Like the guru was not a figure that made you feel inferior. Yeah. It's not authoritative it's not in that a, way. Yeah, yeah, but the guru was a figure that constantly made you feel like they believed in you and that you had potential and that you had value to offer. And so when I wrote this chapter called Your Partner is Your Guru, I break down the qualities of a student and I break down the qualities of a guru. And all of the qualities are a guru is generally your partner who believes in you. And Amazing. I found what I found in relationships is that it's so easy for you to be the most critical person of your partner. Yeah. It's so easy for you to say that, oh yeah, you're just the worst and you're so yeah. like lazy and you're just like, you're not ambitious enough and you're not organized enough. Like, it's so easy. And I found so many couples were in that space. Even if you don't say it, we feel that about yeah. our partners because people say it to other people. The amount of people right. that come to, up to me and say, my partner's not ambitious enough. He doesn't work hard enough. Like, oh, she doesn't understand enough. She's too clingy. Like we have these negative views and actually we should be the ones who see the potential in our partner. Of course, beyond any, and I make this very clear in the book, beyond any abusive or toxic yeah. relationships, yeah we should what, look at the potential in our partner. We should be the ones who are like making them feel like they can grow and become something. Of yeah. course, not ridiculous and stupid ways, mm -hmm. but in a healthy way. If you want a specific new life or you have a path that seems interesting to you, you have to spend more time on that path than around the other people. And so even though I didn't spend a lot of time with the monks every year, that time was really deep in the sense that I was fully immersed, even if I was there for a week or two weeks or a month, I was following the whole program. I was waking up at 4 a.m., I was having the cold showers, I was sleeping in the same way. I wasn't going there and treating it like a vacation. I was going there and doing the work. So in your case, I'm guessing that when you were writing a blog, you were writing a blog really well. You were trying to build a business really well. You were following your path with a sense of intensity and even when you're not getting the results, or in my case, I couldn't just live as a monk for the whole year, that intensity was so strong that I'd come back really charged mm. with all my answers and all my voices in my head saying, no, I know why I'm doing this. And so I was really certain because of my immersiveness. And I think a lot of us, we want to be certain, but we're not obsessed. And it's hard to be certain when you're not obsessed. You can't be half in, half out in your practice of something you want to be, whether it's an entrepreneur, whether it's a creator, whether it's a CEO, or whether it's even a parent, like all of those roles are really powerful, but they're really hard to do when you're kind of half in, half out. And so for me, that was the first thing. I was fully immersed in who I wanted to be. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome.
For 10 more amazing rules from Sadhguru, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. First of all, why are you to so toxic and then you want to de detox yourself? You are eating wrong, you are thinking wrong, your emotions are wrong and you toxed up and now you want to detox. You wind yourself up and then you want to unwind.